Welcome to Founders Club, the show for real estate entrepreneurs. Dude, I love how my skin feels out here in freaking Cali. It's amazing. It's that Cali Beautiful. skin. When I go to uh, um, Vegas, though, God, my lips get chapped all the time. Oh, yeah, Vegas is oh, the worst. It's so bad. You need like a can of lotion and a <laughs> bottle of chapstick. <laughs> <laughs> For real. Very excited to be out here today at the Ritz Carlton in beautiful Laguna Beach. Um, talking to a longtime friend, mentor, business boss, the world famous Corey Boatwright. What's up, brother? Um, <laughs> really excited to talk to him because he's doing a lot of exciting things in the investment space with wholesaling. Um, he's done over a hundred wholesale deals this year already and um, over a thousand transactions lifetime. So he's going to go through kind of the art of wholesaling and how you can leverage it to do more deals, get in front of people, get in the door first, different scenarios like that. When I was at the bar ordering drinks, I asked Corey what he wanted and he said, I don't know, I want the pink one that Sam was drinking. So I ordered him the pink one that Sam was drinking, which is a Gin Gin Mule. That's fantastic. And uh, I'm enjoying the IPA from Green Flash Brewery in San Diego. So cheers. Cheers to that, and we cheers. can kick this thing off. Mm -hmm. You told me a, st a funny story the other day, and I just wanted to touch on it. You told me that you sold 10,000 Ginsu knives <laughs> <laughs> on the internet per month. Per month, yep. Before you got into real estate investing. That's right. That's so right. tell me about that, because that I'm sure is yeah. is a good entrepreneurial story. So uh, on eBay, I was uh, looking at uh, things to sell, and I noticed that this guy was selling Ginsu knives. He's selling them for like ten bucks for a pack of them. Well, if you ever bought Ginsu knives, and you know that those things aren't worth no ten dollars, right? So I was like, I know he's be buying those things cheaper. So I found out where um, a, a wholesaler was, basically where you could buy them. So I ended up uh, buying, or I ended up getting a, a great deal on them. And so uh, I basically used marketing techniques, and I ended up listing a Ginsu knife for one cent, but charging seven dollars ninety nine cents for shipping. Uh huh. Right. The old self liquidating. So, the old self liquidating. <laughs> and so it was a what's called a Dutch auction, I think, or something like that back then. And uh, it blew up. Like I'm talking about, we had four or 500 orders in a day uh, started coming through, and then it just started blowing up more and more. And we started selling more Ginsu knives than uh, other guys that were buying them and even stocking them. Um, but we, we started selling more, so those guys started buying from us, actually. And then I started stocking them into my garage. <laughs> and uh, it got to a place, I think, where I was buying a, Gins a set of Ginsu knives uh, for 50 cents. Okay. And I was selling them to the guys for a dollar. And then I was, then I'd charge, you know, our shipping and handling on that too. And so we had wholesalers, basically, or resellers buying from us, even though we were basically a glorified reseller. And uh, it was funny, man. I had my house rented out, my couch was rented out, my chair was rented out by uh, just like roommates. And uh, in the morning, we would take a FedEx package of Ginsu knives orders and, and drop them off. And then in the afternoon, we'd do the same thing. And it was just freaking selling tons of Ginsu knives <laughs> every single month. And how old are you at this point? Dude, it was, I was in my 20s. Yeah, I was in my 20s. I'm 42 now, so yeah, I was in my 20s. So I think th there's something interesting there, actually, that, and as you said it, it just popped into my head. The, the, the thought of, like, that almost is wholesaling, yeah. right? Like, that, it, it, it's about finding that great deal and being able to hunt the great deals, which I think is something that you've gotten really good at over time, um, is just being able to find and recognize and then capitalize on those good deals that you come across. Yeah, and, those, and at that time, I remember seeing, you know, there was an opportunity because... People were, people were buying, buying Ginsu knives for $10, and then he was charging, I think, another $10 for shipping. But I knew that there is a ton of room There's to just there. crush it, yeah. right, and um, take, take advantage of the fact that I wasn't having to uh, keep inventory of them. So in the beginning, I was just drop shipping them, and then eventually, once I started drop shipping so many of them, then I actually started taking inventory of it. So I felt like I didn't have anything to lose, but I recognized um, the opportunity, you know, to, to take advantage of that pricing. Yeah. That's great. Yeah, man. Corey, the king of Ginsu knives, Boatwright. <laughs> <laughs> That's gonna stick now, right? <laughs> um, all right, so what is wholesaling? 
Let's so, talk about it. Yeah, so wholesaling essentially is, a lot of folks actually confuse this with fix and flipping. Wholesaling, you're just getting the property, you're doing absolutely nothing to it. You might, we might change a door, we might mow the yard, uh, might clean out the property if it's really, really bad, and mm -hmm. that depends. Sometimes we just leave it. Um, the, same, the person that's going to buy it is going to already expect to clean it out, so we may not even have to spend that $1,500 or $1,000 to clean it out. Uh, and we just get it, and we turn around and resell it. And we don't fix it at all, and we just get a property under contract. Okay. So, for example, we get a property under contract. Let's say we're in greater OKC area, so a lot of our deals are under $100,000. So let's say that somebody has a house that they want to sell for whatever reason they're motivated to sell and the house is worth $100,000, but they need to sell quickly. Um, they don't, let's say, owe much on it or they, uh, maybe they don't owe anything on it and they need $62,000, you know, Cash by now. in two weeks from now, let's mm -hmm. say something like that. Okay. And so the fact that we're able to come in and be a solution to someone that can quickly get rid of their property and essentially even though they want the money a lot of these motivated sellers say they want the money mm -hmm. but in reality they want the pain to go away there's a pain associated with having this property and that's why they're calling us and they're not calling a big block agent for example right. um, because they know that for us that it's going to be quick painless and they can have peace of mind okay right and in their minds and i think somebody in the mastermind today was talking about this all over about you have to own it was uh, tristan from lab coat agents mm -hmm. what's up tristan great presentation Shout out to tristan. so you have to own the real estate of the mind that's a that's a mic drop in terms of the power of what that can do for you mm -hmm. because once you understand what your target market, what your demographic, what your, what Evan Pagan used to say, your customer avatar. Once you know your customer avatar so well that you know that they want that pain to go away, then you can be a solutions provider and then you can start focusing on the pain. Okay. Right? And once we do that, we set ourselves apart because we want to make the pain go away. We don't want to go in and and uh, say we're going to go find a buyer and list it. We, we, when we leave the property, we want to tell them this is that value. This is what we can pay for the property. We'll get this thing closed as soon as we possibly can. But I already know that I'm not going to be putting a contract on that property, Oliver, unless I don't. Unless I already know that that property is going to be sold. Okay. So I know my market, mm -hmm. and 90. I mean, most of our, our transactions are cash transactions. Okay. So that also helps us get around a lot of lending and red tape there and all mm -hmm. that other stuff. Mm -hmm. There are some other creative things you can do there, but most of our transactions are cash. And so it's very simple. Um, you can put a property under contract for you know, 50 and have someone that says they're gonna pay 65 for it. And I do nothing yep. and I can walk away with a $15,000 check. So that's the kind of overall premise is you're getting it putting it under contract, have an end buyer already lined up yep. or somewhat lined up yep. to pay a little bit of a premium on it, which yep. is still a discount Light under discount retail. discount for them, right. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, and then that's where you make the money. You make the spread on that. We make the spread. Yep. Okay. So I, I explain it like this. So there's an A, a B, and a C. So A to B. So B is always the wholesaler. For example, A is always a homeowner and C is always the cash end buyer. Mm -hmm. Okay. So A to B is whatever I'm putting that property under contract for, yep. let's say 50,000 in this example. And then B to C is what I'm, the wholesaler, selling the property for, that mm -hmm. contract for to that new cash buyer for 65. And so now I'm getting the $15,000 difference. The cool thing about this is, is because there's two closings, these folks don't t know what you're buying the property for, all they care about is what they are buying it, what right. prices can, that they agreed to. As long as they feel like they're getting a good deal. And they do, they get great They generally deals. aren't gonna care what you got it for. All right. Okay, so um, I just wanna circle back to something that you just said and it was, it has to do with um, the way that you're able to kind of talk to these homeowners is by solving their problems and getting rid of their pain. So I'm guessing a lot of these are distress type sales, but what sort of pain are we talking about here? 
Perfect, uh, great question. So most people focus on the price. I wanna find out what's the why. Why do they call? They're usually calling us from a postcard or some pay-per-click or some marketing that uh, they see that we're buying the property quickly. So why did they call us? And then why, what's the reason that they need to sell so quickly? So usually we'll have a question that says, do you need to sell now in the next 30 days or sometime in the next few months? That's just giving us basically a, a, a hot, a, a warm, and a cold, right? Okay. So on the pain, let's say that somebody um, needs to move in the next 30 days. They have to move, they have no other choice, and they need to sell their property in this time frame too. So I'll start asking them like, what's going on? Uh, you know, so the next 30 days you need to move. So let me ask you this question, Oliver. What's gonna happen if you don't? What's gonna happen if you don't sell the house? And I'll shut up and I'll let them mm. walk into that space. That frame of mind. And that frame and, yeah. of mind. And I know once they walk into there, now they're, they're putting more weight on, it's gonna feel so much more of a relief. So this, a lot of this is psychology. So the psych psychological aspect of it is, is that they're thinking more about, I'm not gonna do, well, I, like I'm almost trapped. I'm not gonna be able to get rid of that property. Mm -hmm. And if I don't, I want them to feel I want, them to, I want them to feel that, and then at that point, I can have a better rapport with them. Does that make yeah. sense? Yeah. So totally. anytime you can connect on a level that's outside of just finances and business, and you can connect on a human level, and you have them telling you what's going to happen if you're not able to get rid of this property in 30 days, and you just shut up and listen, they will tell you everything that you need to focus on making the pain go away. And what sort of things are you hearing? So one would be, you know, I need to, um, my mom is sick and I need to make sure that I'm at a surgery that she needs to, uh, has to go to. Mm -hmm. And if I'm not there, I'm gonna have regrets for the rest of my life. And I have my job that's crazy, is trying to get off work is absolutely horrible. And, uh, and then now I got to deal with this house yep. on top of that, right? Yep. How am I going to get rid of this thing in time to go? And, um, or uh, they got a divorce, right? And so they're dealing with that. And like, I have to have a property sold by X date. The judge said I have to have these things done. Mm -hmm. um, there's a probate situation or an inheritance. So an inheritance is, is really one where it's like, you know, uh, I don't live in that state and I just really would like to sell the property as quick as possible. Mm -hmm. uh, I need to get some money yeah. to do whatever. X, Y, and Z. X, Y, and Z. And if I can just start to ask them what is going to be the opposite. What, if this thing that they want to have happen, if it doesn't happen and I let them actually tell me what that feels like and what they're going to do, they'll tell me everything that I need to know to focus on to make the pain alleviated. And I want to anchor that to doing business with my mm -hmm. company today mm -hmm. will make sure that that goes away. And when, you, when we leave here today, how great is it gonna feel, Oliver, that you know that this part, the house, all the stuff that goes with it, all the stuff in it, all the stuff you don't have to clean out, we take it as is. Mm -hmm. You don't have to worry about the roof, you don't have to worry about the AC, you know, it's done, right? We signed this agreement, it's done. You can sleep well at night and go figure out what else you need to take care of. How good a feeling is that going to be to have that albatross off your shoulders? Exactly, yeah. And then they get the cash. They get, you know, you guys close quick, I'm sure. Yes. Yep, we close as soon as we get clean title. Hey! Yeah. Look at this. Right on cue. Right on cue. <laughs> and this mic is working perfect and fully awesome. charged. Look at this. Oh, great. So. Okay, cool. So it's, it's really about solving those problems for people and being a solution because the reality is, I'm guessing 99% of real estate transactions aren't going to fall into that type of scenario. Right. But that one, two, three percent of the people that need to move now, need the cash, need what, need that problem solved. That's where you come in, and that's where you're able to make all the math work. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. And just, to, I just look at ourselves as a fast solutions provider. For exactly. Them. Exactly. Yeah.
Okay, and how are you finding these? How are you finding these deals? And we use all kinds of math. Our, our, we use a data scientist that used to work at Google um, that, that gives us all kinds of data points on uh, motivated sellers. Uh, we send out anywhere between 40 and 50,000 mail pieces every single month. So in the greater OKC area, um, mail pieces are still working very well for us. We mm. do postcards. We do letters. We also do pay-per-click. Um, we do some... Uh, uh, especially niche lists for probate list, um, and and we have referral business that comes in, so we, we get it from all angles. We, and what's the messaging that you're putting out there? So the messaging is essentially, is this your house, which is one of our postcards that shows actually a, a picture of their house from a Google uh, API that pulls in the image of the house. That's okay. a really high converting uh, card for us. So basically it's saying, hey, do you want to, sell this property uh, and if you do we'd love to uh, talk with you and we can even give you potentially a cash advance before we close and the reason we put that in there is that's just a little hook that that might be a way that we can help them with moving expenses yeah right so if you mm -hmm. know a deal is good enough I'll be fine with giving you 500 to a thousand dollars I'll be fine with it but just so I can put that on there it gives them another reason to contact us out of you know everybody else Okay. And what sort of a response rate are you seeing on the 40, 50,000? Like how many leads does that generate for you? So roughly um, about 400 to 450 calls okay. will come in. And out of that, I would say another 25 to 30% of those are people that actually didn't have a house for sale, mm. but they call because they were upset that we <laughs> mailed them um, and they wanted to let us know about it yeah and sometimes their calls are just really you know mean but um, so we get that and then from there we'll close anywhere from seven to nine deals a month from of the from the from the ones that actually do have a house for sale and then we set appointments okay and then so when you when you come across one of these deals or someone raises their hand what what is the approach with them? How are you approaching the homeowner with your solution? So everything is for us. We have it ran to an individual that takes calls, that knows a company. Uh, then we go to an answering service that asks, asks, uh, a, goes through a script. And essentially, we first question we ask them is, do you have a house for sale, yes or no? Mm -hmm. Because we want to get them off the phone as humanly, quick as humanly possible if they don't. If they don't, yeah, And if sure. they have something to say, we want them to say it right then and not have to wait later on because every one of those costs co costs us money. Um, and then we, so with one of our people that picks up the phone and actually you know, talks to outside the answering service, they'll ask uh, all the same questions. Uh, their answering service does we'll follow the script. Once those questions are answered, which is typically, you know, what kind of, uh, uh, where's the house located? Uh, do you have a mortgage on it? If you do, how much is mm -hmm. left on it? Sometimes they tell us, sometimes they don't. Um, is it vacant? You know, is it listed with an agent right now? Uh, what do you think the house is worth? Which is a really interesting question because <laughs> sometimes people think their house is worth more and sometimes they think their house is worth less, right? And then uh, we also say, well, how much do you want to sell it for? The next question. And then after that, it's like, well, if we just paid you cash and closed quickly, what's the least that you're willing to accept? And the interesting thing about just asking that question is that you'll usually see the person drop another five or even $10,000 just from asking the question. Yep. Why is that? Because I understand the real estate of the mind. Yep. I understand the psychology of what we're doing is they want to sell quickly. And so they just heard, if I can sell it as fast as possible, I'm probably gonna have to take less, even mm -hmm. though I didn't say that. Right. I just said, what is the least that you're willing to accept if I paid you all cash and closed quickly? So because of that, they, they fill in those answers. And uh, then it says, hey, uh, when's the best time that you'd like to have somebody to come out? So we actually set the appointment from the, from the first call. Usually, whatever the, the time they say, it's always fine. That's great. And then we actually have our acquisition manager will call back and change the time if we need to, but we want to get that micro commitment. Committed, yeah. And so that's how we get most of our appointments. And not that's canceled. all outsourced. That uh... so we have an answering service okay. that answers stuff after six o'clock, which mm -hmm. is usually least amount of calls that come in, 
and then during you know till six o'clock we have a, a actual lead manager that handles it in office in office okay cool yeah that's uh that's an interesting point you brought up about the um the technique of asking what's the least amount they'll take because if you watch like the pawn stars and all the pawn broker shows same thing where they're trying to give you instant cash and they're trying to get the best deal same still thing. give you money that's the question that they always ask is what do you think it's worth and then what what's the least, what's the least amount you take for it and so to get that instant discount is just a simple it's a simple question away right so yeah, it's great it's it's incredible to see sometimes when the money just their number you know when they already said you know What's, what's, what do they want for and then what's, it's just amazing to see that number drop and it 95% yeah. of the time does. And you didn't even have to do anything. You have to do anything. <laughs> Ask a question. Um, all right, very cool. And then what about how are you determining your offer price? How am I determining my offer price? So we use a couple of different methods. One is um, WMRP, which stands for worth, market, and then profit, and um, or repa uh, repairs and profit. So worth it basically would be like an ARV and then market is what the fix and flipper or what a buyer is typically buying those properties for so that might be anywhere from uh, 70 cents to 80 cents on the dollar depending on where you are usually okay. in Oklahoma it's around 70 cents on the dollar so let's say the worth is a hundred the, the the ARV is like 70 or the uh, the market is 70,000 and then from there we look at repairs so because we need to make decisions quickly. Right. We often will just find a dollar amount per square footage. And so that works pretty and well. And bake that into your And equation. we bake it into there. And it's actually surprisingly accurate, not by, off by maybe a few thousand dollars uh, from like if a contractor comes out there. Because we uh, we've looked at how much repairs do actually cost. Mm -hmm. And we figured out a dollar per square foot that will be fairly close to at least get a good ballpark. Okay, and, and what is that? What well, is that? It's, ba it's based on what I, it's called pretty, ugly, and scary, okay? okay? So pretty is like, you know, pretty house, doesn't need a lot of repairs at all. So depending on where you are um, and what the contractor charges, you know, that might be $15, $20 square foot, depending on where you are. Mm -hmm. uh, ugly will obviously be higher um, and that's usually just like an ugly house, maybe in a decent area, or you know, maybe it, it definitely needs some paint and maybe some walls fixed and maybe a kitchen or whatever. And then scary is like, you don't want to walk in there because you're afraid that thing's going to fall in on you or okay. like you're going to get- Or you need a hazmat suit. Your hazmat or you're going to get like bed bugs when you walk out. Like, like you, you're actually scared to walk in the house. Okay. And so there you want to put obviously the higher dollar per square foot and uh, but it gives you a pretty good, actually, good range that you can go off of. So you're basically just segmenting into those one of three buckets. One of three, man. Pretty, ugly, ugly scary. scary. And then depending on that, you, that's how you work your numbers backwards. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, cool. and if I'm over, I'd rather be conservative, right? I'd rather not, you know, be too, like, I want to be, if I, maybe the repairs were only 15000 I thought they are twenty. My goal is to basically get the get the agreement to come out and have the appointment. And so I can get in front of them, then we can have a lot more body language than just on the phone. Yeah. Right? Makes so sense. So if I can get on the phone and, and we're there and I'm at the property, then belly to belly. Belly to belly. There's nothing better. Yeah. Yeah, that is always the best way. I mean, you're always going to find a better um, better deals to be had when you get belly to belly to people because you can feel what they're saying, they can feel what you're saying, and right. you can really bring that human element to connect on a deeper lever, level and have like meaningful conversations around that. Um, Absolutely. Once you've kind of determined your number, mm -hmm. what's the next step? How are you contracting these properties? So, yeah, so once we get to a meeting of the minds, right, we always, there's like a little gap typically. So someone maybe wants 60,000 for it and we're at 55 mm -hmm. or we're at 50 and then, so there's a gap. So then we just start focusing on the gap, not the dollar amount because the bigger dollar amount sounds bigger. But if I can just say, you know what, Oliver, you're at 60, I'm at 55. So we have a $5,000 gap. 
So obviously I want to make sure that we can get this done for you, but like our cash buy criteria, we're pushing it at 55 right now. Mm -hmm. And I know that you, you know, want 60 for it. So I just want to walk you through here, um, you know, where I'm coming up with these numbers and then I'll actually walk them through a scenario of what it costs if they were to list it typically or pay the agents mm. now, all and the then fees, the repairs, all, uh -huh. the fees. So we will the walk time. through that time with them, right? Mm -hmm. And actually get them to psychologically understand that we're just not throwing a number out there. Right. Obviously, we'll, we'll have comps that before we go to the property, we'll actually have comps that we pulled that have give us usually the three lowest comp, and then we'll look at the three highest comps. Okay. And so that'll give us a good basis to be able to have a, a, a fair discussion with them because, you know, if a house is 2010, we can't compare it to their house as 1972. Right. Right. And so it comes down to having more negotiation tools. But once we actually get to a meeting of mine, we sign the agreement. Then the next thing that we do is we take a picture of that agreement and we send it over to our title company. And the title company immediately starts working on it. Okay. And we already know at that point that we need to, now it's hot potato. Now we need to get the property sold. Yeah. So at that point, um, you've met with them, you've taken the picture, you've sent it to the title rep. Is the title rep's job just basically looking for landmines at that point? Yeah. I so mean, I'm gonna sure be you've already for... pulled preliminary stuff and yeah. figured out loan amounts and things like that. Right. So what the title company uh, job is to do is to make sure they have clean and markable title to the end buyer. Right. So we want to make sure and I assume that all homeowners are liars. It's not like their intention is to lie sure. to you most of the time. Sometimes it is. But I just assume that all homeowners are liars. And the reason is, is because we've had Trust so many. verify. They have so <laughs> many liens that pop up. Yeah. And, and it's. The or craziest things. That sometimes things. they've even forgotten about. They've forgotten yeah. about them. We had like a $67,000 auto lien that we got released for $1,000. Oh, wow. Like the person already had a bankruptcy a long time ago and it was already written off and like they weren't going to get anything. And so to get $1,000 was huge. Yeah. And so obviously doing short sales back in the day, you know, we had to. <laughs> we had to you pay knew that negotiating ten, game, yeah. 10 cents on the dollar, 20 cents on the dollar for a lot of. Uh, debts and a lot of folks don't know how to do that. The option to purchase agreement is, is a wicked cool agreement because it gives us the option to purchase and it tells them that they have to sell to us. So we have the option to purchase but they have to sell to us. So it's a really cool agreement um, and it basically is something that we use whenever we have that gap that we talked about and we can't get there like they're mm. stuck on that 60 and we're right. stuck at 55 and just we cannot get there. So then we use the option agreement, and then from there, that gives us an ability in the verbiage of that option agreement that says that we can market that property on however we see fit. Mm. And we can put signs in the yard. We can do a lot of things with that property. If they actually give us the right to list it on MLS if we want, which is pretty powerful. That is e extremely powerful, and I wanna talk about that in a second, but let me, let me circle back to, um, just understanding what you just said, you're saying you're putting an option on the property. So when we cannot get our number for the uh, purchase and sale, then we go to the option. Then you go to the option. So basically, anytime an acquisition manager goes to a property to meet with them, we want them to walk out with the contract no matter what. So if you get the number, if they say in the original example that 55, they yep. say, cool, we'll take it, yep. then you just buy it right there. That's right. We, we put a contract on it. They already know it's sold. There's no, you know, we didn't meet. We got our price. Mm -hmm. Then we're waiting. We just send it over to title. We're waiting on clean and markable title, and then we're going to set a time to close. And if they say the other way, they say, no, I want 60K, but you think you might still be able to make it work, that's when you put an option on it? That's right. And often, whenever we do that, the funny thing is, is that about one, I, I think about one to two deals, maybe more every three months, every quarter, the ones that we put options on will actually end up agreeing because they know that we've either talked to other people, mm. We put them on a drip schedule. It's like, you know, we're going to follow up with you in two weeks, see how things go. You know, I can come back and say, Oliver, I, I have talked to every one of our buyers. You know, I've, I, I, well, our number's still at 50, right? And your number's at 60, you know? But, I mean, I might be able to push it to 52, right? Something like that. Right. And, and, you know, often we'll get them 
to go ahead and, and give us the price for that 52 or whatever it is because they know that we've earnestly went out there, marketed it. They haven't had time to do anything like that. Yeah. Um, and then they, we've also got their commitment. They already signed an agreement with us, so we make it real easy that we can just exercise our option and it will do an addendum at a new price, whatever that is, mm -hmm. and then we're off to the races. And then the option, are you putting money down in that scenario? No, we don't. Well, we, $10 is $10. what you can have. At the, at the title company, you can have a, a check. And basically. that's only because something has to be given. Yeah, love and affection is really what an earnest is. In Oklahoma, we still put a dollar amount. Yeah. Yeah, just just in case. So. Yeah. But we don't have any issues Makes with sense. that. I yeah. Mean, yeah, that's probably the safer way to do it anyways. Yeah. Um, okay, cool. So now I want to talk about the other side, which is the disposition, right? Like once you've gotten it, you've got your end buyer lined up, you know that they're willing to pay, let's say, I don't know, um, 75 or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, Walk me through that. How does that work? How does the closing? Yeah, so we get the buyer. So when we talk to the buyer, the buyer never, we're never assigning our contract. Like, I'll, I'll just let me, I'll just sign a contract. A lot of people say sign it. Well, when you assign the contract, you're essentially telling that end buyer that you're buying it for less, mm -hmm. okay? Compared to just, ne just negotiating on a price of what they're willing to pay for the property, right? In this case, yeah, if we buy it for 50 and they're, we're, we're negotiating it at, let's say we started at 69.5, and mm -hmm. the most they're willing to give us is 65, then we just never talk about an assignment or anything like that. Got it. And often, I mean, they can care less anyway if we're going to double close a transaction or not, most, most of the time. Um, and so we just get a contract for them. Now, our contract with them, we want them to put down a nice, uh, a, a, a strong earnest money. Yeah. So that's usually $1,000, and if it's, Got a lot of demand on that property. It may be twenty-five hundred dollars to lock uh, it up. Just to lock it up, mm -hmm. and we let them know. Listen, you know, this money is uh, non-refundable. If so, you need to make sure to go and look at the property. So before you put in your contract, you need to understand we have a lot of interest on this. So whatever number you're putting in, your earnest is you're gonna. If you bail, you lose it. You're, you're gonna lose it. And we, we they know that, right? Uh, not that we purposely want to take that earnest, but we also don't want to miss out on other people that came in that we could have got and we had it tied up for a week. And, and as far as the, the double close or the concurrent close, which is kind of a taboo subject in real estate, um, it sounds like in Oklahoma that's business as usual, dry state. Dry state. Um, so tell me a little bit about how that works, how you do both the closings back to back like yeah, that. Yeah, so we'll line up a closing at uh, 10 a.m. and the other closing at 11 a.m., for example, and we'll come in and, and basically it, it, it really has everything to do with the title agent, um, how she, she sets them up. but. At the end of the day, um, they already have our contract to purchase. Um, so we usually have the buyer actually come in first, cash buyer, mm -hmm. they'll close on that, and then we'll have the seller come in, and then they'll sign on their paperwork, and they take care of everything else in terms of the HUD. And so the C buyer puts their 75 in. Escrow you or take whatever it is. Your cut, the, they, or they take you, the pay 50. Out, you, you pay out seller A. Yep. The 50, the, the 50. 55 or mm -hmm. whatever it is, and that spread is left in the account, and that goes to you. That's right. And so what sort of um, profit are you looking for on deals like this, or what's yeah. your average profit well, on a deal like this? Yeah, so our average to date is around 12,001, 12,077, I believe, right, right around there. So we were at like 10... 10 something, 10 like seven or a nine last year. Mm -hmm. So every year so far, so last year was our best year. This year, 2018 has been our best year. Um, we'll probably get very close to 112 deals this year, which would be awesome. Mm -hmm. um, and I think last year we did like 103, which was awesome. And, and these aren't like huge transactions, but for example, some of these, you can get these big wins. I'll give you an example of a big win. A big win is uh, we found a property that somebody wanted to sell very, very quickly. They had their own reasons. I forgot what it was, but it had something to do with um, they needed money to uh, move and help a family member. And it, it, they're kind of weird, uh, strange people. And I didn't really want to ask any more. Like, I don't know yeah. everything else. But they needed basically $11,000, and the property was worth $90,000. 
right? So this property was actually in an area that was upcoming mm -hmm. and being gentrified and all this. And so we ended up getting this property for $11,000. We sold it, I want to say for like sixty-nine dollars or $70,000. So think about it, that's a for for us in Oklahoma that was a big that's, that's a like big, a grand slam that's a big hit. I mean, in all reality, like even making twelve thousand profit on a deal where the retail price is seventy five thousand. I mean, that's that's really good, impressive numbers. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, wholesaling. You know, I work with the students, and 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 one of the things that people ask me is, like, what if I, should I do a lease options? Should I do fix and flip? You can do anything you want to do, but Wholesaling is the least risky thing, in my opinion, that you can do as long as you know how to do it correctly. Mm -hmm. um, you're not shady about it. Someone actually walks you through and how to do it correctly. And you know that uh, you're not gonna be caught with a property. In other words, you tell somebody you're gonna pay X amount for it, and for every, whatever reason you can't find this buyer, you need to make sure you can actually pay for that property. So sometimes that holds people back. But the numbers that you're putting, typically people will sell these things at a discount that is anywhere from 40 to 60 cents on the dollar. For the one wow. that we looked at, uh, I mean, that big hit was you know, probably worth 90. We bought it for 11. So what is that, like 15 cents on the dollar? Yeah. So every once in a while, you're going to have That's these big hits. Right. And That's a grand slam it's home a, run. It's a, grand, it yeah, yeah. it's a grand slam. And there's ways that we can actually focus in and, and double down on how can we find... What, what made that deal special? Like most of the time people go, oh, I'll just go to the next deal. Like I'm really big how on- How did that happen? I'm and really how big do we on do it data. Again? Like I want to duplicate the success. Yeah. yeah. So how did that deal happen? Like what are the factors involved with that deal? Mm -hmm. And it was it just a one-time thing or is it something that would be duplicatable? Yeah. So that's when we look at these data points and the polygon marketing method and all those things. So that is uh, exciting. So was that the biggest one you ever did? No, no. We've done some bigger than that. Yeah. What's the biggest one? I think the biggest one, I, I, well, I wholesale uh, the apartment complex. We made over $300,000 on that. So that was a big wholesale, but it was on a multifamily deal. Awesome. Uh, on a single family, I believe it was a short sale I did back in like 2000. 10 or 2011 and I want to say I made like 160,000 of it. Wow. And it was and a short was the sale. sales price. It was a that? short sale deal. I believe it was around 600,000. So it was a really really big home run. That's there was great. like three liens on it. It was, you know, the deal where you had to negotiate 10 cents on the dollar and I think the last one took 50 cents on the dollar so it created a lot of a lot of equity. But it so was it in a looked great like area. there was a lot of liens there. But you went above and beyond to not just pay them off, but negotiate a discount on each one of those? Yeah, so the, the people get, so they, they see a property or they see something that has these liens on it, and they think, oh, there's liens on it, so there's no equity. Yep. I, I mean, that is like the kiss of death in terms of what you could do to your profits if right. you're going to get into short sales. I don't really, you know, do many short sales now, although I think that maybe Short sales 2.0 might be coming back, but I, I've done a lot of them. I mean, a lot of short sales, um, but it got kind of squirrely and harder to do the deals. Um, but I do think that uh, the process of learning how to do those short sales and negotiating on liens uh, really helps even now mm -hmm. because when you get anything on title, I know a lot of things will be released off of it. For example, I know that if there is um, you know something that has to do with uh, DHS or there's something that has to do with a tax lien or whatever. It may not be associated with the property. It may be associated with the owner, mm. right? And the owner, I can, that means they can still sell the property and I, and I don't, it moves with them. It moves with them, right? Um, and there's also ways that you can talk with the owner that if they're found you know, to be in a situation where they can't pay their bills, they may actually be able to apply with their CPA or the tax guy and get a write-off from the government mm -hmm. that they won't even owe those things. So just by working with us and letting us tell them some of those things that they can, they might consider, we're not CPAs, we're not those professionals, but at least they can go consider it, then um, that can be another, you know, just another benefit for them. And I, I think that's a hugely important lesson overall, right? Even for real estate agents, like if you have a seller 
that has two or three like mechanics liens yeah. or different things like that right. on there um, and may not think that they have equity. Imagine what a hero you would be if oh. you took that deal, negotiated yeah. their $60,000 lien down to a thousand bucks and all of a sudden you've made them a ton of extra money. Or in your case, right, that's work that you do to increase your profits. And right. I think that's a huge takeaway because all of those things are negotiable. And if you just reach out and to your point, a lot of those people have forgotten about it long ago, never thought they were gonna get paid. If it goes to foreclosure, they'll get nothing. So oftentimes they're willing to take a lot less than the amount that's actually owed. Right. And that's a win-win for everybody. Absolutely. So do you have, on deals in California, are there a lot of liens that pop up? On? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, mechanics liens, tax liens, all sorts of stuff pops up. That, all stuff. And it's it's all negotiable, right? Like all you can, negotiable. You can, you can reach out directly to those people and say, hey, I'm representing this sale and we want to get you paid, right? That's the magic words. We want to get you paid. Perfect. But there's not enough there to get you paid this. Why would you be willing to take this? And in that scenario, everybody wins because they're getting cash, in which case they would get nothing. Right. The homeowner is getting a discount or the investor is getting a discount and everybody's winning. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so that's a, it's a great way, I would think, because obviously in, in San Diego, California, your median house is a lot higher, five, six hundred thousand dollars or whatever. I think in Oklahoma, it's like 120 or 30. Right. So three or four times difference, right? But that would be even more significant. Right. Right. Yeah, if someone huge. really learned, an agent really understood the power of negotiating second liens. Yep. Uh, and negotiating anything that's an encumbrance on the title. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I'm talking about working with attorneys. Attorneys, the best way to, to negotiate an attorney's lien is hiring your attorney to negotiate for the attorney's lien. You don't go in and negotiate with the attorney. They speak a they speak legalese. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right? It's like golfers speak golf and musicians speak musician. So, you know, music. So there's an understanding that is yeah. harder for you. And a professional respect, professional, professional respect. courtesy, right? Yes, it's all right. that. So I think there's a big opportunity uh, for agents to potentially learn about that negotiating aspect because mm -hmm. they may not get able to, to have that property sell right. because all of a sudden this lien pops up. Yep. But if they have someone that they, there's their go-to, and maybe they give that person a, a piece yeah, of course. for helping. Why not? Then a little bit of, uh, you know, a little bit of something's better than a whole lot of, you know, <laughs> nothing. <laughs> I like that. Um, and then, so how are you getting paid as the wholesaler? So we get paid at closing. Okay. And so uh, then from, from, you know, from there, uh, we distribute from guys on our team. So, I mean, it's right at closing. Uh, we get wires, you know, and this just happens very, very quickly. And then everybody gets their, their cut, everybody gets their guy, cut. And and team. Like, so most of these deals are all cash. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's a really simple transaction. Yeah. And uh, we pay, you know, acquisition managers different uh, percentages, and we pay our uh, sales guys a uh, different percentage. Um, but, uh, and then we have a cut for you know how, how we're working with our partners, but at the end of the day, it just comes down to the net wire, mm -hmm. right? As we call it the net wire, and then we distribute, you know, from there. So right now, that number is like says around twelve one, and uh, we spend like on our marketing. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if that's something that's interesting to you. So on our marketing, we we're spending right now probably in the neighborhood of twenty to twenty five thousand a month. So not a whole lot of marketing. And so have you figured out what that is per deal? Like yes. how much marketing dollars per deal are you spending? Yeah, man. Yeah. And what is and that it, the, I mean, it's, it's actually shocking. I see you smiling. So it's yeah, gotta it's, be it's, good. Well, it's shocking. You know, it's, uh, you know, when you actually look at a cost per deal, you know, it can be, you know, anywhere from like 2,800 to $3,200 cost per deal. Um, but you can also look at each one of these marketing mediums, mm -hmm. like pay-per-click is different. Right. Right, the cost per deal for pay-per-click is much different than, for example, a postcard, right? Or if you're tapping into a niche list where your, your mailers were small, and then your profit can be just exorbitant, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, so the, the numbers can be pretty exciting for sure. That's very exciting. Yeah, I'm man. very excited for you, I think, uh, You've really got that figured out, which is very cool. It's, it's kind of a niche within a niche. And I think that 
you've done a great job kind of inserting yourself into it, learning the game, learning how to do it the right way. And then like you said, getting better and better at it to where you're, the number of deals you're doing is going up, the number of profit, the amount of profit per deal is going up. Yep. So kudos to you. Um, what is what is one thing that you wish you knew when you started? Or what's one thing looking back that, man, if I would have just known this, it would have made such a difference earlier on? Beyond a shadow of a doubt, buying multifamily apartments. If I would have known more about buying multifamily apartments, we just took down 128 units. I'm raising money for another that 294 unit. We're looking at other ones now. I just believe, especially you know during 2005 and six, and I just believe a, I, I would have you know, thousands and thousands of units. Investors watching this right now, or um, even the agents watching this right now, learn multifamily, learn about multifamily apartments, learn about NOI, learn about gross rents, learn about uh, forced appreciation, learn all of these cost segregation, learn about all of these benefits that come from multifamily investing because that is legacy stuff. So the wholesaling thing mm -hmm. is, a, is you know, every month it starts over, essentially. That's good cash now. It's cash now, right? And there's really not a lot of risk, really, you know? I don't have to go out and get a mortgage on the mm -hmm. property, right? Not a lot of risk. They're cash transactions and pretty pretty profitable, right? Um, and the way that we have it set up right now, pretty, pretty automated, too. You know, I'm a big fan of automation tools and things, so I'm not spending a whole lot of time having to manage a big arbitrage of things. Mm -hmm. So wholesaling is a really small business that you can, I mean, you can blow it up as big as you want, but you don't have to have a huge payroll. You don't have to, a lot of people are being paid on commission. A lot of them are on 1099, depending on how you set it up. If you have set up employees, okay. But so you have this opportunity. Well, with, with multifamily apartments, it's this passive income that comes in essentially forever. And depending on how you structure it and if you get into it where it's cash flowing in the beginning and you get into it where it's non-recourse debt, mm -hmm. meaning that if there's some reason that the property didn't perform for too long and went into foreclosure, that they're not going to go after you personally. So you didn't personally sign, right? You, you, you didn't personally guarantee it. You have a non-recourse debt, so they take the asset back. So you've heard yeah. of asset-based lending. Yep. Essentially, it's a, at 60 units and above, typically, there's a asset-based lending aspect of that that is non-recourse. Well, you're so not personally on the you're hook You're not personally for it. on the hook. So that's super exciting, too. Not that you want to, you know, but things happen or whatever. It's just so good you peace just, of mind. It's good yeah. peace of mind. You sleep at night. And then just by raising rents, Oliver, and you know this because you have some multifamily apartments, just by raising rents $10, right? No one's going to move out if I raise rents for $10. Like it'd be more of a hassle to move out. But what that does on like 100 units mm -hmm. by raising rents by $10, right? Now my extra money that's coming in is like over $12,000 over $12, a year. And then that adds another value to the apartments, Increases it, which yeah. the NOI then goes up. And the cool thing about multifamily apartments is not uh, what uh, Lance, I can't think of his last name, but this, this another multifamily investor basically says, fill estate and real estate. <laughs> so fill estate is what we're in. Single family homes is fill estate. You walk in the kitchen, that feels kind of strange. You walk into the bedroom. <laughs> I don't know, the layout feels kind of strange. You walk into a you know, bathroom, oh, the bathroom feels weird, right? Your feel estate. But with multifamily apartments, it's real estate. It's how many units, what's the T12, what's the rent roll, what's the rent roll? What's it, what's, what, what are the financials, right. right? And then you can find out your your values. And so it's, it's exciting to me to see, um, to learn more about that. And then you can not only get these great deals that pay passively, for potentially ever, mm -hmm. right? Because you can defer, you can do 1031s into another multifamily apartment complex. You can have all kinds of incredible tax benefits, which all of us have a partner, which is Uncle Sam. So the, the benefits of multifamily investing just from the tax savings mm -hmm. is, uh, is tremendous. So I know, I'm, dude, I wish I would have known more about multifamily apartments. There it is, multifamily apartments. I actually did another episode on that as well, so if you want to check that out, In the Know with Kevin Easterly. Shout out to Kevin, great apartment investor. Awesome. And um, if anybody wants to get a hold of you, how do they do that? Yeah, they can go to coreyboatwright.com. 
That's my website. And uh, they can go on Facebook, Corey Boatwright. Go on Instagram, uh, Real Estate Investing Profits. And I'd love to uh, have you listen to our podcast, which is Real Estate Investing Profit Masters, where we bring on amazing investors and they tell their story about what apps they like to use and why they do what they do and um, you know, do they get eight hours of sleep at night and what's their best investing strategy and all these other things. So it's really, really cool what books they like. So we, we, we uh, have a lot of uh, listeners for that, several countries, and uh, love to have them check that out. Love it, man. Definitely check his stuff out. Super legit. Great guy to follow. Really appreciate you appreciate being on the you, show. Bro. Had yeah, a great man. time. Very informative. And uh, Cheers. we'll have to do this again soon for sure. Absolutely. Now you're in the know. Cheers. Cheers.